One of the main goals during the space race was the exploration of the moon. And you probably think, the United States were the first to get to the moon, right? However, the Soviet Union during the early years of the space race were actually far ahead of the United States. They were not only the first to fly by the moon, but also impact the lunar surface. And they pulled even further ahead in the space race when they sent the first cosmonaut or first person into space, being Yuri Gagarin. So how did the United States plan on catching up to the Soviet Union, and what was NASA's Ranger program? Let's talk about that. Before I begin, if you're curious as to what the very first missions to go to the moon were, their accomplishments and the failures that they ran into, as well as why these two superpowers wanted to go to the moon in the first place, I would recommend you watching this video. It goes a lot more in depth than these earlier missions and showcases just how hard it is to get to the moon. But to continue on, at the end of that video, we were talking about the NASA administrator at the time, James Webb, and he had put together a proposal suggesting that we could reach or the United States could reach the moon before 1970. And when he sent this proposal to the president at the time, John F. Kennedy, he originally declined it because he didn't think the American people were interested or needed this program. However, just a few weeks after declining this in April of 1961, Yuri Gagarin, a Russian cosmonaut, became the very first person to not only get to space, but also orbit the Earth. And after this event, this drastically changed John F. Kennedy's opinion on the space program. In fact, just a week after the launch of Yuri Gagarin, John F. Kennedy had a few questions for his vice president, who was Lyndon B. Johnson. Some of these questions include, do we have a chance at beating the Soviets by putting a laboratory in space, or by a trip around the moon, or by a rocket to land on the moon, or by a rocket to go to the moon and back with a man? Is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win? Now, these were some great questions for Lyndon B. Johnson. However, he was the vice president and not a rocket scientist. So he ended up reaching out to a famous rocket scientist at the time known as Warner Von Braun or Werner Von Braun, depending on the pronunciation you'd prefer. However, Von Braun had a really great answer for these questions, and it mostly based off of their launch capabilities, or how much the two superpowers could get into space. Von Braun estimated that the Soviet Union could get around 6,350 kilograms to space, whereas the United States could only get around 1,800 kilograms, which is much smaller than what the Soviet Union was capable of. Because of these values, Von Braun was able to estimate what the Soviet Union was capable of. And in fact, it was a lot of the goals the United States wanted to achieve, including a laboratory in space where multiple cosmonauts could work. They could also potentially land a spacecraft on the moon, no people on board, but just a robotic lander. And if they were really pushing it, they might be able to send a cosmonaut on a trip around the moon and bring them safely back to Earth. Just a week after Warner Von Braun made these remarks to John F. Kennedy, Alan Shepard became the first American astronaut to fly into space, thus giving a lot more confidence to the general American public as well as the president that NASA could do this. However, they would have to kick it into high gear and get a lot of work done. So just a week after Alan Shepard's flight, John F. Kennedy went to Congress saying the following. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. In May of 1961, there was now political backing to land astronauts on the surface of the moon by the end of the decade. And this is because they saw that as the only way they could truly beat the Soviet Union in the space race. But the better question is, how did NASA go from being so far behind the Soviet Union in terms of launch capabilities and technological spacecraft capabilities to eventually landing people on the surface of the moon?
And the answer is that they had a series of programs that were focusing primarily on the exploration of the moon. These programs including the Ranger program, the Surveyor program, and the Lunar Orbital program. But in this video, I'm going to primarily be talking about the Ranger program. And in future videos, I will be covering Surveyor and the Lunar Orbital program. What was the Ranger program? Let's think about this for a second. In 1961, the only form of moon exploration that NASA had achieved was a flyby at a pretty far distance and they didn't even get pictures of the moon. In fact, the Soviet Union was so far ahead because they had sent multiple spacecraft that had done multiple flybys, impacted the surface, and even taken pictures of the far side of the moon, whereas NASA was pretty far behind. Therefore, the ultimate goal for the Ranger program was to take close-up images of the surface of the moon to try and prepare for eventual landings on the surface. However, they didn't want to orbit the moon, but rather run directly into it, impact the surface, which meant they would have to take images as they were approaching the surface and relay them back to Earth as quick as possible before it impacted. Now, the plan was for the first two Ranger missions to not even leave Earth orbit, basically to test the spacecraft overall and see if there are any mission failures or things that they had to fix. Now, the spacecraft design of these first two Ranger missions included a hexagonal base which was 1.5 meters in diameter, and two solar panels that would come out stretching five meters in distance from one tip to the next. Now the overall spacecraft weighed 306 kilograms, and there were a lot of instruments on board for scientific reasons. Some of these instruments including various telescopes, cosmic ray chambers, ways to measure the magnetic field or Earth's magnetic field once they leave the atmosphere, as well as particle detectors to try and get information about the sun's rays or solar flux. The first Ranger mission launched on August 23rd of 1961, and the spacecraft launched on top of an Atlas Agena B rocket. And everything was going according to plan until the orbit insertion burn, which just a few seconds after the initial burn began, it cut off, which it wasn't supposed to. And because of this, it didn't have enough velocity or speed to get into the orbit that they wanted to. And because it wasn't in the right orbit, it wasn't designed for this. There are a lot of electrical issues, orientation issues. Basically, nothing worked as according to plan. And just a week after the launch, it re-entered the atmosphere, primarily because it was a failed mission. So for the first Ranger attempt, it was a failure. That wasn't going to stop NASA, however. They were ready for the Ranger 2 spacecraft. Again, this one wasn't going to the moon, but rather going to orbit around the Earth, much like Ranger 1. Essentially the same design, same rocket, same everything. And the launch took place on November 18th of 1961, and essentially the same thing happened. When the Atlas Agena B rocket got to the orbit insertion burn, the engine turned off a few seconds into the burn, it didn't enter the intended orbit, and ended up deorbiting a couple days later, not achieving what they wanted at all and being another major failure for the Ranger program. Now just a couple months following the Ranger 2 failure, Ranger 3 was ready to go, and this was the very first of the Ranger missions to actually go to the moon, or try to go to the moon I should say. Because on January 26th of 1962, the spacecraft launched on the same rocket as before, and instead of it stopping during the orbital insertion burn, about a minute into the flight, they lost fine control on the rocket, and therefore it continued to burn until it ran out of all of its fuel. So this is quite the opposite. Instead of not getting enough speed, it got way too much speed, and they weren't able to fix it. So ultimately, instead of impacting the surface of the moon, it performed a flyby of 36,000 kilometers away from the lunar surface. So this too was a failure, not only because they weren't able to impact the moon, but also because on the way they had a lot of computer malfunctions and weren't able to get any data back from the mission. So, so far, JPL, which was in charge of the Ranger program, was 0 for 3. Following Ranger 3, a few months later was Ranger 4. And as you can probably predict, it was the same design as Ranger 3, just trying to fix a couple of the issues they ran into before, had the exact same rocket, the Atlas Agena B, and it was launching on April 23rd of 1962. But this time, the launch worked. All the maneuvers went according to plan. But there was an issue. When JPL or Command Center tried to contact Ranger 4, it ended up not sending any data back, or it wasn't responsive. 
and it's thought that the internal computer's timer ended up not working. But it did impact the moon, so it was kind of a success and kind of a failure because they were able to impact the surface of the moon, but we got no data from it. At this time, you can probably imagine there was a lot of criticism for both NASA and JPL because they were 0 for 4 in this program. They weren't even able to get the first two that didn't go to the moon to work, and even the one that did impact the moon, they got no data from. So people were really skeptical about the spacecraft design for Ranger was actually functional. However, there was a little bit more hope because the Mariner program ended up using the Ranger design as their baseline and Mariner 2 was a successful flyby of Venus. So there was hope that it could work for Ranger 5. The Ranger 5 spacecraft, as you can probably guess, had the same design as the Ranger 3 and Ranger 4 spacecraft. It ended up launching on October 18th of 1962, which was around six months after the Ranger 4 failure. Now again, the launch was a success and a lot of the early maneuvers went well, but just a couple hours into the mission, the solar panels didn't deploy and therefore the mission again was a failure. It didn't end up impacting the moon and they didn't get any information from it. So again, JPL was 0 for 5 on their Ranger program. After the Ranger 5 failure, NASA had to put together a board of people to figure out what all was going wrong with the Ranger program. And they came up with a few solutions, including changing the management at JPL to try and get a better program going, adding redundant systems to the spacecraft so that if one thing fails, the whole spacecraft doesn't fail, as well as changing the overall design of the mission itself. Not by too much, but making sure that they implement more technology that might be coming from outside companies rather than developing the whole thing at JPL. Now alongside these updates to the mission, Congress was not happy with the fact that all these missions were failing. Therefore, they ended up cutting half of the budget. Therefore, they lost 50% of the intended missions that were going to happen for the Ranger program. So they really only had a few more chances to get things right. And to make things more interesting, since they had to add redundant systems, they ended up adding five more cameras to the spacecraft. And by adding five more cameras, they had to get rid of weight somewhere else. So they ended up ditching a lot of the scientific experiments on board, which didn't make scientists happy. So at the end of the day, before any of the other Ranger programs or as of Ranger 5's failure, a lot of people weren't happy with the Ranger program overall. After all these design changes in 1963, they were ready for Ranger 6, which launched on January 30th of 1964. And again, everything was going perfect according to plan. The rocket was going on its way and on the right path to get to the moon. But there was one weird bit of information that happened. For a few moments during the launch, the cameras ended up sending their telemetry data down to ground station, which people really didn't know why they did this. However, JPL found themselves in a bad situation because the cameras themselves ran on their own battery power, which means that if they were going to try and test them on their way to the moon, that could mean that they would run out of battery and not get any images of the moon itself. So they ended up not testing it and just see if the cameras were going to work on impact. So as they were approaching the moon, they were ready to turn the cameras on and they didn't turn on. So again, Ranger 6 was a failed mission. However, their impact zone was incredible. They were aiming for the Sea of Tranquility, which you may know as the Apollo 11 landing site, and they were able to hit it. They accurately hit a location on the moon pretty precisely. However, they received no images of the surface, again, not achieving the main goal of the Ranger program. This was not good for JPL, NASA, or the United States as a whole, because it was 1964. Their plan was in five years to land astronauts on the surface of the moon safely, and they weren't even able to take pictures of the moon and send them back with an impactor. How were they going to solve this issue? So now it was time for Ranger 7. It launched on July 28th of 1964. And everything was going according to plan. The cameras ended up working and it successfully hit the moon in the targeted location. And all the data was sent back. This was a major success for NASA, JPL, and the United States in being able to catch up to the Soviet Union in their endeavors.
Here are some of the images that it received on this mission. And in fact, Ranger 7 became the very first spacecraft to take images of the moon, and here's even one from an altitude of 488 meters above the surface. This gave them a lot of insight about what the surface of the moon looked like and helped them prepare for eventual landing modules. Now just for fun of it, let's look at a current image of the moon and where Ranger 7 actually impacted. This came from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a currently active mission around the moon. So following this, about seven months later, on February 17th of 1965, Ranger 8 would launch, and it would be aiming again for the Sea of Tranquility. It too was a major success. It received many images as it approached the Sea of Tranquility, and in fact ended up landing just 70 kilometers away from where the Apollo 11 landing site would land just four and a half years after this impact. After the success of Ranger 8, a month later on March 21st of 1965, they launched Ranger 9, which was the last of the Ranger missions. And ultimately, it sent back images approaching the surface of the moon, including this really cool video that puts all these images together as it's descending to the surface. Ultimately, the Ranger program really showed that it took a while for JPL to be able to actually succeed in terms of impacting the moon and sending images back. However, once they were successful with Ranger 7, Ranger 8, and Ranger 9, it really helped in the up and coming missions of landing spacecraft on the surface of the moon and getting ready for the Apollo landings. So with all that being said, what do you find most interesting about the Ranger program? Was it one of the failures or some of the images that they got back? Let me know in the comments below. But thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.